Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free, and that's thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting the Tough Girl Podcast and its mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media, then please do go check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. Female patrons who sign up at the $5 level are invited to come and join the Tough Girl Tribe, a closed Facebook community community where you can connect with other like-minded individuals from around the world who have a passion for adventure and challenge. Today I'm absolutely delighted that we are going to be speaking to Mara Hafizi. She's also known as the Fit Londoner. She's done an Ironman UK, she's done a multi-stage desert ultra, she's done an ultra duathlon, she is an endurance sport enthusiast. My name is Mara and I also run the Fit Londoner and basically I aim to encourage women and men um, but also but more specifically women of colour to step outside their comfort zones, challenge themselves and um, I do that by stepping outside my own comfort zones by doing the events that I've done. In March recently with a group of other girls I took part in an event called the Speed Project which involved running from LA to Vegas 340 miles miles very little sleep I think we probably had like three hours sleep each all together all of us were stepping outside our comfort zones in different ways and um, showing other people that they too can achieve what they want by stepping outside their comfort zones I love it I mean the speed project sounds absolutely epic what a challenge and we'll definitely talk about that later but I'd love to find out what life was like for you growing up did you come from a sporty family did you play sports at all were you were you academic you know what was like what was life like for you growing up? Uh, so primary school um, and up to primary school, I was fairly sporty. Um, I did horse riding. I don't know how I did it thinking about it now because as an adult I've got two left feet but I did uh, tap dancing and ballet and I don't know how I got into it but Irish dancing as well. <laughs> I was into it all and then um, I kind of grew out well not grew out, but I stopped liking um, and playing um, sports probably f- during secondary school, although I did play netball for my school team as well. That was really fun. I mean, goalkeeper and goal defence, my favourite positions. But yeah, otherwise I didn't really play sports that much besides that. I mean, when it came to PE lessons, I absolutely dreaded them. Gymnastics, Oh, it was uh, awful. Swimming was a total nightmare. Like I had a phobia of deep water. So when it, like any excuse that I could have to avoid swimming, headaches, forgetting my swimming costume, having three week periods, which I, like, just making up anything to avoid going into the pool, I would do it. Yeah, uh, rounders, tennis. I was just not that great at PE. So you said you've got a phobia of the water. What, where did that come from? Just before primary school, um, I had a bit of a like bullying incident and I got pushed into the pool, and very nearly drowned, but I'm alive, so it's fine now. <laughs> um, that incident kind of traumatised me for a very long time. And uh, just growing up after that, I just found it terrifying going into, you know, swimming in lakes, going into the sea, going into the deep end of the pool. If I couldn't touch my feet on the ground, I was just like terrified. So that's how that kick started. Oh, Mara, I'm so sorry that happened to you. That's absolutely awful. You said as well that you stopped sort of playing and enjoying sports in secondary school apart apart from the netball. Why was that? Uh, I guess I was more academic and I think it's also a cultural thing among Indian families and Asian families there's a lot of emphasis particularly among the girls and boys I guess as well to a certain extent being really really academic focused you know getting as many higher grades as possible A isn't good enough A star is even is the best so I think there was a lot of emphasis on that but I was more inclined to work towards my studies and focus on that And I guess the concept of balancing sports and academics wasn't something that I'd really considered. And if I was probably to tell younger people, like when I um, like younger people, I'd say, you know, you can balance the two. They can coexist. 
You went on to do to do law school. Were you managing to sort of fit exercise in while you were at law school? Because that's obviously a very intense uh, time period as well with regards <laughs> to like academic study. That was when I really kind of understood about balancing the two, um, you know, if waking up early, if necessary, doing things like to do lists and checklists and just being really, really organised and on top of everything made it a lot easier to balance the two. So you mentioned that you did the speed project in 2019, running from LA to Vegas, 340 miles. What would you say was your first big challenge or where, when did you decide to start going outside your comfort zone and just really starting to challenge yourself physically? I had done um, a couple of marathons and at the end of my fourth marathon, I think I was at, um, it was uh, in Verona in Italy uh, and I realised like, oh, I really want to do something exciting next for what? And I wanted something uh, that was, you know, would really, really challenge me in ways that I hadn't been challenged before. I mean, I thought, oh, I could try and uh, train for a faster marathon time. But at the same time, I did, I felt that that was too much within my comfort zones. That's when I thought about Ironman. I, I don't know where I heard about it exactly, but I just remember thinking, I've got to do this. Uh, I mean, the barriers at the time where I didn't have a bike and I've got to kind of get over the swimming phobia. So I was like, okay, right, I can work towards those. I can start saving up for everything that I need. It's just going to have to be a long process and journey. And there was a lot of arming and eyeing at first as to whether or not I really wanted to do this because I was really, really scared about the swim in particular. But then I was just like, you know what? I've just got to do it. As soon as I paid the entry fee for Ironman UK, I was just like, okay, right, I've paid this much for it. I have to do it. There's no going back now. I think crossing the finishing line at Verona Marathon was the pivotal moment for me. Tell me more about your marathon running and your marathon training. How did you fit it in? Were you sort of running to, were you working at this point or were you still in school? I was at law school for my first one. My first one was at Hamburg in Germany. So I, the reason why I decided to do marathons and, uh, was because it was also a kind of good way, I thought, to experience a new city, um, have a whirlwind tour of that area. And also it was a nice excuse for a holiday. One of the reasons why I also chose Hamburg at the time was because There was something about the fact that there were fewer women who were taking part in Hamburg Marathon that really drew me into it. Because I remember thinking, why are there fewer women? Um, This can't be, you know, there's something about that that really fascinated me. And so that drew me into that. Were your family supportive of your marathon running? Yes. They were. I mean, at first, I think my parents were a bit weirded out by what I was doing. They were just a bit like, really, you're going to do that? And I think it, it took them a bit of a while uh, to process what I was doing. But it's now got to a point where they're very much familiar with what I'm doing. And they're much more supportive. And when it comes to my next events, they're like, oh, OK, you're doing that. Or when I'm not doing anything, when I'm when I'm not training for any particular event, they're like, "Oh, you haven't got a race coming up. What, what what's happened?" So I think that they've it's become very normal now for them. But uh, yeah, I think they definitely do support what I do. You've run these four marathons. You finished with the Verona Marathon. It's your fourth marathon in 2016. But you were you were looking for your next goal, and you wanted it something that would really challenge you. I'm really interested in what made you take that final step towards the Ironman because there's quite a few barriers there. You know, you said you don't have a bike. You've obviously you know a deep seated phobia and fear of the water, understandably. But how did you end up hitting that submit button? Uh, I think it was the distances as well, because I thought that if I did a shorter triathlon, I didn't feel like it would have really, I wanted to do an event that I felt like I had really conquered my fears. And I thought that the distance for the Ironman swim, which is just under 4k, was, you know, I thought, once I've done that swim, then I know that I have conquered my fear. Because A, it's also going to take a long time to work uh, towards that. If it was a shorter triathlon, you know, it would only be a couple of months 
of training towards that. So I, I also wanted it to be something that I would take if I'd really, really enjoyed it. I wanted to work on afterwards. And I thought nine, 10 months of training would be enough for me to work out whether or not I really would be able to conquer that swim. So you've signed up. What do you do next? What is your next step? My next step was buying the bike. Oh my goodness. So I have so many stories about the bike. I'd cycled lots when I was younger, but as a teenager, not so much. And like within as an adult, I hadn't really cycled. So a road bike was not something that I was very much used to. And also the whole setup. I mean, when I bought my road bike, took it home, I remembered looking at it and thinking, oh, they don't have any gears on my bike. I think they've sold me a bike without any gears. So, Because <laughs> I was used to the bikes that I'd had when I was younger when the gears were at the top and it was just very, very easy to change. So I was like, oh, I'm going to be really, really embarrassing and I'm, I'm just going to be really embarrassed. I'm going to have to go to the shop and say this to them. Like, I can't actually find the gears. <laughs> um, so I went to the shop and asked. As much as it felt embarrassing to ask them that, it was also kind of a mini lesson for me in that, you you know, no question is a stupid question and you should never feel too embarrassed to ask about a for help in any sense. And I take that on now. So like, I mean, if I've got a question for something, if I'm really, really stuck, I don't really think about whether or not how much it's embarrassing me anymore. I just got to think, you know, I want to know the answer. What did you do next? So you, you signed up for the race. Like where, where, where did you start? Like how did you start to put a, a plan together? Was it a case of working backwards? Did you get like a triathlon coach? Did you get a swim coach? Did you have a massive to-do list of what you needed to do? Did you start researching or had you done all your researching before? I'd done all my research before. I think that I was sign before signing up to the Ironman UK race, in order for me to be uh, to have been 100% sure that I was going to do it, I did a lot of research into what, what would the training be like, how long would I be training for at my peak, what should I be expecting, and things like that throughout training. And I think some of the barriers that I'd faced in the lead uh, once I'd signed up was actually finding a coach because quite a lot of people told me that I, I wouldn't be able to complete it because I didn't have the experience completing triathlons before and I hadn't really swum and I hadn't really cycled in a long time as well so once I'd found someone that was really really helpful because I didn't even know like how I'd go about training in terms of what the sessions meant and things like that and then it was also buying the bike as well knowing about bikes I'd as well so that was a whole learning process as well getting a coach is brilliant because I think it does help take the, the take the pressure off and it you know especially when it comes to training it can be difficult to balance it all in especially when there's obviously a bike a swim and a run but I'd love to talk more about the swimming and getting confident for, for you how did you build your confidence up around water how did you get past your phobia what did you need to do I had a lot of people helping me with that because I remember the first few months of training, one of the first few times I got into, so where I trained, they had a 50 meter pool and a 25 meter pool. And I'd done a couple of sessions in the 25 meter pool and I thought, right, okay, I think I'm okay now at this. So one day then I decided to go to the 50 meter pool. I just remembered being really scared when I got to the edge of the pool because I didn't realise how deep it was. It was so deep and I just thought, oh my gosh, I can't do this. There were quite a few times where I'd sit at the edge of the pool, you know, waiting and hoping that I would pluck up the courage to go and do a lap. And I mean, I remember the, the first time I think I did a lap I accidentally hit someone's elbow whilst I was swimming and they got a bit annoyed at me. So uh, and then that, that was a bit of a bump in the confidence. Then I got a couple of people to help me out with the swimming. Um, I did a lot of swim technique courses and also worked one to one. I found that working one to one with people was a lot easier in tackling it 
than working within a group because I think when you're high, when you're in a group, especially when you've got a deep seated fear of something, it's easy to hide away. Whereas if you've got a one to one session with someone, you can't hide away from your fears. You have to um, face them. That was uh, one of the ways, uh, some of the ways that I did that. Eventually, when it was open water swimming season, swimming in the 50 meter pool was fine. But then when I got into the open water swimming, that was a completely different experience. And again, yeah, I found that swimming one-to-one sessions with people. So I went with one company called Swim Open, who was so helpful in helping me get over that in open in an open waters swimming setting. I found that also continuously practicing and just doing it as much as I could really, really helps. That that whole consistency helped as well. Oh, that's fantastic. I, de- I definitely agree. I think getting those one-to-one lessons is absolutely spot on, even just to help with the technique as well. I mean, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the other things that, um, that you've actually written about in your blog as well is actually... Um, is the financial side of things and trying to do because triathlons at the end of the day they are expensive and it can end up being a big investment you had a budget of a thousand pounds um do you just want to share more about what you spent your budget on where your money ended up going and how you figured that out because that is unfortunately you know money is a barrier to to entry for, for 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 something like an ironman yeah, I mean, first of all, if someone wanted to do an Ironman, uh, what I later discovered was you can get the same sort of distance as an Ironman, but as a non-branded, there are other race organisers that do it at a half the price. That's one thing. For example, the bike is one of the most expensive pieces of equipment in a triathlon kit. Um, and I think that there's a lot of pressure to buy a high price and certain type of bike. So what I've learn as well was there are so many ways you can get around getting a good bike but at a lower price so for example you know speaking to people at your local tri clubs as well there's a lot of people selling them there and then uh, sales were a a dream I think there were a couple of shops near me that were closing down that had uh, massive closing down sales so I bought loads of kit at a fraction of the price there. Tell us about the event how did your Ironman go? It was amazing. It was it was obviously very tough, but there were so many different aspects to it that were so memorable. I mean, I remember when I finished the swim, I didn't know how I was going to feel about the swim. But once I completed the swim, I was like, wow, that was a lot. I mean, it was hard, but it was a lot easier than I had thought it was going to be I mean I'd stressed so much about the cutoff time about that for so long but I'd done it within this cutoff time and then I wondered whether or not I was going to have negative feelings about the swim but yeah I really really enjoyed the swim um, as well and the bike was amazing I mean I got to have (laughs) <laughs> at some points many chats of people uh, during the bike ride uh, which I didn't really expect to happen but yeah it was amazing and the course was uh, re- uh, I mean I think from what I've been told there's a lot of um, people say that our uh, Bolton's uh, the Bolton course isn't the most glamorous events we went through some really nice parts on the bike course as well uh, and then the run was memorable in so many different ways uh, I mean <laughs> I'd never seen anything like that before people were zo- like some people looked like zombies and some people were I mean I think I remember seeing one person uh, throwing up at one point during the uh, race and uh, I think I stopped at, uh, and asked them like are you okay do you want me to get you uh, any help and they were just like no you know I just want to complete it and it was also a very very hot day as well it was a very hot summer's day it was really memorable I think towards the end of the run I think there was a part that I was slightly struggling on because I was thinking oh are we there yet are we there yet but I remember seeing a couple of finishers with Domino's boxes and I just thought okay we get pizza at the end that's a good uh, that's a good motivation so that really has led me to the finishing line I think uh, and I definitely do one of those again and I think the very fact that I was saying that I feel is quite a momentous moment for me as well. Once you finished, when did you start thinking about your next challenge? 
I think a couple of days later, I think the month, the next day I felt so broken. I'd never felt that broken before. But the Tuesday afterwards, I was just like, oh, I, I, you know what? When it started to sink in what I'd done, I started thinking, you know what? I could do something like this again, but what should I do next? And I want it to be something that really, that challenges me again. And um, also, whilst I'm, I've got this fitness levels as well, let me kind of take this to my advantage. That's when um, I decided to do the ultra duathlon in London, which was a really, really great experience. And then the run in the Wadi Ram Desert with Ultra X. So that was a 250k run over five days. And that was an incredible experience. Wow. Seeing the Wadi Ram Desert in that setting was incredible. And the weather as well. And that also was another learning experience as well. Kind of seeing how you could challenge yourself to run each the each of the distances every day especially when you're feeling tired so basically you finish your Ironman almost pretty much straight away you decide to do the ultra duathlon and the Wadi Rum Desert Ultra did that sort of stop you getting any post Ironman blues or did, did you sort of suffer a little bit afterwards or were you sort of did you continue your straight your training on straight through for the ultra duathlon yeah, so one of the reasons why I'd also decided to do those events was because I'd heard so much about the post Ironman Blues and I was adamant that I wasn't going to get them. So I thought, whilst I'm at this sort of fitness level, why don't I take on those events? So yeah, that's what drew me in as well. So tell everyone a little bit more about the London Duathlon. What is it? What's involved? And how long did you have in between finishing the Ironman to doing this challenge? So the London Ultra Duathlon was a ultra duathlon in Richmond Park. Uh, it's not the flattest of events. And it's basically, for those who don't know about duathlons, it's a run, bike, run. And so the distances were 20 kilometre run and then a 77 kilometre bike and then 10k run. One of the reasons why it also drew me in was because there were hardly any women doing it. And I think, yeah, I think I mentioned this earlier when I talked about Hamburg Marathon. Some of the events that draw me in is because of that lack of women. So when I did Ironman, I think they said that like 15% of the entrants were female. And for me, I want to encourage women to do these things. And so there's studies, plenty of studies that have shown that women are really, really good at endurance events. And so I would love to see more women taking on these events. 100%. I agree. Totally. Yeah. What was the biggest mental challenge for you on a race like that? I mean, what are you thinking about when you're running or swimming? What's going through your head? So the ultra duathlon, I think one of the mental challenges with that was also it was a lapped course. It was a multi-lap. So you're going about the same lap. You're doing the bike lap, for example, seven times. Um, and so doing the same lap over and over again, it can get to a point where you're just like, oh, my gosh, are we nearly there? Are we nearly there? So it's going through all those processes to really try and help you stay motivated. I mean, it be, for me, it's anything like thinking about why I'm doing it. I think connecting with the reason why you're doing um, a really long distance event as well is really important because that can help you to retain that motivation. You mentioned the desert as well. So the Wadi Rum Ultra. Share more about that. How did that come about? So that came about because this lady called Lauren, who runs an organisation called Team Like a Girl, which aims to encourage girls and women to take up challenges, asked me to be on the team for a group of girls and ladies doing the Wadi Rum Ultra. So I was like, oh, OK, you know what? Like, a, I do like a holiday and I do like a challenge and I do like hot weather. So... <laughs> it's all perfect for me this is a perfect setting so I jumped at the chance and I took part in that and yeah it was a great event because I got to see and meet so many people but also unlike other multi-stage ultras 
this this was also quite small in terms of the number of participants. So we were able to get to know each other really, really well. And that I really, really liked. So you're, you're part of this team. Now, is this like an all expenses paid trip or did you need to financially contribute? Like, how did that work? Oh, no, no. So it was fine. Um, we all paid for it ourselves. So it was self-funded. With this team that you're part of, we all run, were you running as individuals as part of a team? Or was it like a team event where all your scores got added together and it was like a team element of the competition? Or were you just sort of like individuals under the team banner? So we were all um, in sort of doing it individually, but under the team banner of Team Like a Girl. And yeah, as, as part of my training for all the um, endurance events I do, I use my hashtag Defy Expectations Together, which is just basically about encouraging people to defy the expectations that they have set uh, or that they have about themselves, what people think about them. Your hashtag is defy expectations together. Yeah. Brilliant. And where did that come from? So that came from when I was doing Ironman training and I thought about how I wanted to get people involved in my journey as well. One of the big challenges about doing the Desert Ultra is the heat and being actually in the desert. How did you train for the heat? I love the heat. I, I, I love hot Me weather. too. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many different ways that you can go about acclimatizing to the heat. So, for example, if you have one um, in your like near you, there's, there's places like the Altitude Center, although that's more primarily about getting used to running at different altitudes. But also you can get heat chambers as well so they will set the sort of chamber the room at a specific temperature or humidity levels uh, and then you can either have a watt bike or a treadmill and do your session there which was really 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 helpful in getting used to running at higher temperatures also things like wearing lots and lots of layers whilst you're outside and doing a run with those layers on as well and um, doing sauna sessions, a couple of sauna sessions or brick, Bikram yoga as well, or hot yoga in general. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Love a bit of Bikram, Bikram yoga. So you worked with a coach for your Ironman. Were you also working with a coach for the ultra run? Yeah, for the um, multi-stage run. Yeah, I worked with a coach to help me kind of build up that distance over time. What would be like a typical week of, of training or what would be, yeah, like how, what were you, were you focusing on specific things? Were you doing weight training at the same time or is it purely sort of running based? It was a mixture. I uh, wanted to retain a bit of that swimming. So um, I did cross training in the form of swimming. And then in terms of strength training, I found that I didn't really like doing um, the normal the typical strength sessions in the gym by myself so I decided to go um, and do CrossFit sessions so um, I've, I've got a CrossFit box that I'm a member of and so I did some of my sessions uh, with them as well. You're doing a lot of training I mean how many hours of training do you think <laughs> you're doing uh, during the week? I think I was doing about 13 hours a week 13-14 hours. Awesome and how are you recovering what were you doing were you doing anything specific to help your body recover? and to stop you getting injured yeah so um having a sports massage therapist was really really helpful and uh so the guy that i have has been he's uh, he's helped me throughout all my events foam rolling epsom salts and stretching as much as we all find stretching so boring and laborious <laughs> <laughs> it had to be done and yeah <laughs> I have to say I'm looking at my phone roller right now it's in the corner of my me eye too. and it just me sits too. there in my room like making me feel guilty <laughs> for not using it enough of the time yeah <laughs> so how would you compare the Iron Man to the Ultra and it's really really hard to compare the two because they're both so different I mean the I, I, I think in some ways the multi-stage is harder but then in some ways the Ironman is harder because for example with the multi-stage you've got to bring all your food with you make sure you've got all your food packed with you for the whole week and so being able to know that uh, that you've packed enough food 
is important. And then um, with the, but then on the other hand, the bike is really hard in terms of um, nutrition on uh, the Ironman because you've got to make sure that you've you're eating enough, but you also you don't have as much space to pack everything all in. It's really hard to say which one is the hardest because they both differ. The great thing. Um, about the multi-stage race was at the end of each day you've got physios and sports massage therapists to help you with all your niggles and pains and aches so that really really helped because um, you'd wake up the next day feeling slightly fresher than you'd expected. I mean one of the interesting things that that I think about in terms of the Ironman or in terms of multi-stage endurance races it's the mental side like you know physically you can you can do all the training you can put the hours in you can make sure you focus on your nutrition your sleep your supplements and everything else but it's the mental aspects of what happens during a race had you done mental preparation before the desert run or was this just something that you'd built up through running marathons doing your Ironman yeah what was your mental preparation like and, and what happened during the race so I think in terms of how I prepared mentally um, I think little things like getting used to training without my music because I can be quite um, heavily reliant on you know listening to music to help me stay motivated but when you're in the in the desert and you haven't you've forgotten your battery pack <laughs> you can't you've got very very limited um, battery power on your phone so you can't really listen to that much music so you've got to get used to being able to run long periods without music and then on the Ironman you're not allowed to have um, any sort of music with you any headphones so um, I think that was a big big challenge but I think I'd also been able to build up that mental preparation throughout uh, training as well. Were you doing visualization? Were you picturing yourself crossing the finish line? Yeah. So for me, visualization is a massive part of when I'm, you know, when it's the le- weeks leading up to an event. If I know what that finishing line looks like and then I visualize myself crossing that finishing line, that really helps me if I'm um, at that place a couple of days before or the day before an event, I'll just walk a couple of meters down the finishing line if I can and that will really really hammer in visualizing myself finishing that crossing line so that when I do have any dark moments during the event I can just picture myself crossing it and it really really helps. What was the team like? How did the team work? Yeah, so I mean, that was great. We all had different experiences and also different backgrounds. So we had one lady on that on the team who hadn't really run before to others who had completed ultras before and then um, others who had some experience in one or two multi-stage before. So we really ranged in terms of abilities and fitness levels and background in terms of running as well. At the beginning of 2019, you did an event, which you mentioned at the very start, called the Speed Project, a 340-mile ultramarathon relay from LA to Las Vegas. I mean, absolutely incredible. Where did this idea come from and how did you get involved in the Speed Project? Yeah, so the Speed Project is one of those events I found that if you're in the know, or if you're in those circles, everyone knows about it. But if you're not in those circles, no one's ever heard of it. And I'd been following um, them on the event on social media for a couple of years. And it's one of those events where you don't actually know how to, to register. Like there isn't a proper website in that sort of sense having watched all the Instagram stories on the race day and things like that, it looked so exciting. And then one day, one of the ladies on the team, the team, our team captain, Roche, um, she contacted me because she knew that I wanted to be on um, what I was really interested in the speed project. And she just, she said that she was going to form a team. So she asked me if I wanted to join. So I was like, yes, you, you know, I want to be on this thing. You know that I've been really, really interested interested in the speed product let's do this so yeah that's how I got into taking part in it this year so how does it actually work 
It's really, really interesting. They don't. So the Speed Project is an unsanctioned race. So there are no rules. Well, the only rule that they have is that you have to follow the you have to abide by the US highway code and the US law in general. But otherwise, in terms of race, um, of races, it doesn't actually have any rules. And in terms of routes, they um, give you an example route, which they say is the safest and fastest route to get from LA to Vegas. But it's up to your team if you follow that route or if you make your own route up. So yeah, it's really, really, it's really interesting. And um, we had an RV and we had an SUV. And so most teams, I think, did this as well. Um, We split up. uh, So four of us would be in the RV and the other four of us would be in the SUV. And then we also had um, two drivers and we also had a sports massage therapist who was on hand. Those guys were absolutely amazing and so crucial to our team as well. And was it all human powered? Was it just purely running or were you allowed to like cycle as well? It was all running, but parts of the course where the RV and the, or the SUV couldn't follow the runner. Um, but if we wanted to, we could have a cyclist to tag along with the runner. We didn't do that, but we did have parts where um, some of the guys who are, are some of the guys on our crew would tag along and run sections of that uh, of our segments with us if we wanted to. So how did it work then? Was it sort of like a non a non-stop race from the get-go? And then how did you break it down? Was it a case of right, right, you do 10 miles, you do 10 miles? Or like what was, yeah, like how did it all work? Yeah, so it's basically a relay, um, and a, r- a really, really long relay. And um, again, going back to the fact there's no kind of um, rules, it's up to us how we, every team, how they break up um, the route. So um, we followed the route that the um, uh, organisers had given everyone. Um, and so we decided that we'd split our team up. So we had four in the RV and four in the SUV. And so the SUV would drive ahead of um, the RV. And basically the, those in the RV would do segments each, each of the runners. And then once we met up with the SUV, we would swap So those who were in the SUV would go into the RV and do their running segments and those in the RV would go back and go into the SUV. So were people running individually and then like tagging a person? So the the cars would drop people off at like a certain distance between them? Yeah, yeah. And what was the distance between the people? From LA to Death Valley, it ranged anywhere between three miles to uh, nine miles. And then once we got to uh, Death Valley, because that was um, because of the elevation and the heat as well, um, we broke that up according to how we felt. So it might be anything like two miles, one mile, three miles. And then there were certain sections towards the end where we broke it up into like 500 metres, 600 metres um, a mile. So it was very much based on how we felt once we got out of Death Valley. And then once we were very close from there to uh, Las Vegas, we then went back to like three miles, four miles, one mile segments. What was the favourite bit about that whole challenge? My favourite part was running on the motorways, the highways. Like I first thought I was, I was a bit like, oh, this is a bit nervous. Like, you know, having cars driving past you really, really fast whilst you're running on the uh, motorways. But then it kind of, you kind of got a bit of a thrill out of it. There was something quite like fascinating and really interesting about that and then making sure that you weren't lost as well because there's no set route as well we the route wasn't signposted or anything so making sure that you were on the right route to the vehicles as well it it was there were so many parts to it that were really memorable and uh, exciting what was the biggest challenge for you during that race lack of sleep (laughs) <laughs> I love my sleep and being able to stay awake as much as possible over that period of time over the, I think we, yeah over those 50 hours was really really hard also because you're in the RV and SUV with 
a group of people over a long period of time, you get to see everyone's different sides. So there were tense moments, but I think that's so inevitable in these kind of occasions. But it was also really great because we also bonded in so many ways. And yeah, we all got to really know each other. And we're all still friends after that, which is important. And how long did it take you to do the whole thing? So the whole thing took us um, about 49 to 50 hours. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So a long time, (laughs) a whole weekend. Were there many other women doing this race? There were a couple of teams, but not that many. What was next after that then, after that challenge? So I'm now training for Woburn uh, Middle Distance Triathlon. So that's half the distance of a full Ironman. And I've got that in September. But yeah, no, I'm looking forward to something else for next year, something bigger. I'm not quite sure yet. I'm looking at a couple of things, so haven't quite decided yet. How do you decide what you're going to do next? Like, do you have a process that you work through? It's got to be something that really, really challenges me. It's got to be something that I've got to really, really connect with why I want to do it. There's got to be something about it that seems very challenging so um challenges in me challenges me in um, ways that I haven't been challenged before can you give us any any clues of where which direction you think you're heading or is is you is it literally like no no idea idea at the moment (laughs) I've no idea at the moment I mean I was looking at doing a double Ironman and then I was looking at doing um race across America so I don't know yet what it was it's going to be big that's, but I haven't quite decided what yet. Ooh, watch this space. Amazing. <laughs> and how's all your training going at the moment? Yeah, it's really, really good. Um, um, yeah, getting back into the swing of things and it's perfect weather for open water swimming. And yeah, getting on my bike. I've just, I learned uh, during Ironman training that I'm not a winter cyclist. So I'm taking full advantage of this warm summer that we have and cycling as much as possible. You blog and you write and you share more about your challenges. Do you just want to share more about the Fit Londoner, what it is that you write? about why people should go and visit your website and what they can find when they when they do go there my blog is www.thefitlondoner.com and my instagram is at mara m-a-r-a dot the fit londoner and basically you can just follow my journey the highs and lows and find out what's challenging me and how I'm conquering everything and what events I'm training for um, and also discussing the barriers that people face in different sports and also how we can encourage women and men and women of color and everyone to kind of step outside their comfort zones and challenge themselves. So talking about encouraging um, you know other women and especially women of color to get outside their comfort zone what advice and top tips would you have one of the things that I do on my social media is I also promote uh, athletes female athletes or who people may not have necessarily been aware of because the media and the brands don't really mention them so um, I spotlight them um, you know, talk about you know who they are what they've like what achievements they have done and I think putting spotlight on that really really helps in showing people you know the kind of barriers that these particular women have faced and that yes you can conquer them and I think embracing your fears is really really important and getting comfortable with being uncomfortable is also very important because it also opens up pathways that you'd never have expected. I mean is there anyone that you want to shout out that that you've particularly been inspired by maybe been a role model for you um, that you'd love to love to share now so other people can can go follow them? One of my inspirations I guess is Geeta Fogart so she's an Indian female wrestler and she was the first to win India's first ever gold medal for wrestling at the Commonwealth Games in 2010 Um, and she um, she had a lot of barriers because she was the only girl doing it at the time. And one of my other inspirations is Hazra Khan, who plays football. Uh, She's the first Pakistani footballer among men and women to get signed by a foreign club. And that was in 2017. So these women have faced plenty of barriers, particularly within both within their culture and also just outside of their culture. But they have managed to conquer them and um, achieved high level 
in their chosen sports. So I'd love to do some quick fire questions with you. Now, my questions may be quick, but your answers don't necessarily have to be that quick. Okay. <laughs> okay yeah. Are you ready? Okay, go for it. Um, are you a tea or coffee person? Oh, gosh. It really depends on the weather. <laughs> uh, uh, coffee. <laughs> coffee. Are you a morning lark or a night owl? Night owl. My, ooh, interesting. What time do you get up in the morning? Five o'clock. But I do that with difficulty great difficulty could you tell me a little bit more about your morning routine so you get up your alarm goes off at five o'clock what happens next so the event that I'm training for at the moment for example has a lot of double days so what I will do is one of my morning sessions whatever I've got on the plan and then big breakfast and then I will probably well at the moment because like I said I'm a summer cyclist I'll cycle into work that's my pretty much my morning routine I wish I could say it was very 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 exciting but it it really isn't (laughs) Um, so what book are you currently reading at the moment the book that I'm currently reading at the moment is I mean it's one of those people development ones but it's uh, how to win friends and influence people that's a great book Mara did you see why I did that yeah I mean I've only just started I've only I've only just started it I was finishing (laughs) finishing just before that how to deal with difficult people (laughs) you you haven't yeah okay it's a good book I'm I'm going through some great at the moment. I mean, yeah. <laughs> what about a film? Do you have a favourite film or movie, like your go-to film? My go-to film would be, oh, this would be so cliche, um, Mean Girls. <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> what about music? What music do you listen to? I, oh my gosh, I listen to such a variety of music. I know this is meant to be a quick fly around, um, but I can go into an ad. <laughs> but I th- it would range between, so if I need motivation, again, cliche, but Beyonce. But then also um, I love listening to Arabic um, and Indian music as well, which I love. What about your food? Favourite food? Oh my God, I can't think. Favourite food? I can't think. As a uh-huh. guess. What about a favourite piece of kit? Would be my uh, earphones, my Aftershocks earphones. They, I mean, since I've discovered wireless earphones, I just, I, can't, I don't know why I ever had, was like, you know, those iPhone earphones just, they don't, they don't cut it. <laughs> When you're on a bike, what's your go-to snack? Peanut butter sandwiches. Do you have like a mantra or a motto or words that you live by that have helped to inspire you in your life? My motto would be uh, stepping outside your comfort zone. Mara, thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast to share more about your journey, the different challenges that you've been on and accomplished. Absolutely inspiring. I'll make sure to include all of your social media links and your blog, thefitlondoner.com, in the show notes as well so more people can follow along with your journey. Thanks for having me. Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed the episode with Mara. What an absolute legend. So everything that we've discussed um, today will be available in the show notes, which you can find on the Tough Girl blog at toughgirlchallenges.com, which is the website which holds everything. Um, it's basically the, the the command center, so well worth checking out. On the website, you can find more information about me, my background, my story, the different challenges that I've done from through hiking the Appalachian Trail to cycling Pacific Coast Highway. There's also more information about the previous guests that we've had on the Tough Girl podcast, as well as information about the different books that I've written from running the Marathon de Sarves to climbing Kilimanjaro and chalet hosting. There is also links as well to the Patreon page. So Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. You can click through there and it will take you through um, and show you the different levels that you can support at. So if you listen to the Tough Girl Podcast on a regular basis, if you listen at least once a month or twice a month, then please consider signing up as a patron at $5 or $10 a month. Think of it as a regular monthly magazine subscription. Or alternatively, if you've just, you know, first time you've listened or you've listened for quite a while and you don't really want to sign up for the, for the monthly contribution, you can actually do a one-off donation. So if you go to the website, you can scroll down to the bottom and there is a donate bus donate button which is basically donating via paypal you can send money to me in sterling you can send money to me in us dollars and what that money does is allows me to fund the running cost because obviously you know running a website hosting a podcast does cost time and um, time and money to produce this content and i'm so so passionate about increasing the amount of female role models at the end of the day but i also do need to survive and i do have bills to pay so any help would be really gratefully appreciated but have an incredible 
incredible day wherever you are, whatever you are doing. Just give it your all. Give it 110%. I believe in you. Take that first step. Go for it. Make it happen. And you have to start. You have to take that first step. Um, I will be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode. Thank you so much for listening. Take care. Lots of love. Bye. Bye.